I am uh, Jim Porter. I have a background in the disk area for 23 years. I published market studies on the disk drive industry. And I can say the first disk drive I ever saw was the first disk drive when I went to work for the company that got that one back in the 50s. But uh, let me introduce George Alexi, who uh, is a back, uh, background uh, which is different from mine, and who will start this interview by going into the background with Ellie. Yep, and I'm George Alexi, a uh, member of the Computer History Museum's uh, Special Interest Group in Semiconductor Memories. So I'm going to be coming at the interview from a semiconductor perspective, and we're very pleased to have Ellie Harari here with us today, uh, now retired CEO, founder, and president of uh, a large company that is well known in the Valley around the world, SanDisk, uh, also an entrepreneur and technologist. So welcome, Ellie. We're very pleased to have you here for this interview. Thank you. It's um, a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. I thought we might start uh, with some background uh, from you, such as when you were born, where were you were born, the, the early days. Yes, so I, my parents came, uh, I was born in Israel at that time, 1945, June 1945. It was still Palestine, con uh, um, controlled by the British. Uh, I'm told that uh, when I was eight days old, my parents took me back home from the hospital in a pram and and the British, uh, so there was a curfew, and the British uh, soldiers uh, stopped my parents with a pram and searched me <laughs> in case I had something. So this is eight days old. Anyway, I, um, I grew up uh, in Israel until age 13, then went to England to a boarding school. My parents wanted me to become an English gentleman. And, um, at 18, I entered the Israeli uh, military compulsory service, uh, slight, slightly over two years in the Air Force. I was uh, a technical clerk and, uh, and then started my education first uh, physics at Manchester University, England. So was this the Air Force, your first introduction to technology and electronics? In a, yes, you could say that, but uh, yes. So, so uh, as you went to university, what universities did you attend? And, and what was it that got you interested in the course of study that you pursued? What was, your, what was the driving factor that captured your imagination and, and lit that spark? Well, without any doubt, it was um, Kennedy's, Jack Kennedy's speech about 1961 you know, landing a man on the moon and re returning him safely before the end of the decade. Um, so I was 16 at that time. In 57, when I was 11, was the Sputnik, of course. So we grew up in the age where, you know, you know, there was no limit. I mean, the sky's the limit, space. And, uh, and I was really um, inspired by Kennedy's uh, vision. And in fact, arrived in the United States to do my PhD work here just just a month after Neil Armstrong actually stepped on the moon. Oh, fascinating. One. Yes. So where was your first university? In, you said in, in England, was it? Or yes, I, I attended uh, uh, one year at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem studying math, math and physics, then transferred to Manchester for physics. Graduated in 1969 with a physics degree, and then came to the United States, um, the Princeton University, Princeton, okay. New Jersey. Princeton, I did uh, my PhD work in uh, what, what is called solid state sciences, which is really a branch of physics, applied physics, okay. and um, graduated in 73. So was this what got you involved in semiconductors, the, the uh, applied physics and solid state physics? Yes, yes. So what types of things were you working on at the university? University, uh, I, this was the, the, the height, height of the Cold War, and um, you know, um, early satellites, communication satellites, spy satellites were failing in space. Um, so I was funded, my PhD work was funded by the Office of Naval Research, and the Navy wanted to understand why satellites were failing after a very t short time in space. Earth orbits, after three months they would fail, the electronics would stop working. So my, my thesis work was really, my research work was to try to understand the failure mechanism in radiation hardened devices. And it turned out to my great luck that I was working on the right materials, which was 
SiO2, silicon dioxide, films of SiO2, and aluminum oxide, thin films of that. And uh, the physics that uh, I developed as an experimental physicist turned out to be the physics that uh, influenced very much later on my career in non-volatile memories, flash memory. Interesting. Excellent. So a as you finished uh, at Princeton, what was your first uh, job out of college, out of the university? So I came to the West Coast. I had a job offer from uh, Hughes Aircraft and uh, Rockwell, both to work on space radiation effects, space, basically semiconductors in space. I worked at Hughes. Hughes was a, um, um, a, a private, uh, non-profit non uh, company. It was owned by Howard Hughes. Uh, had phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, labs. You could do just about anything you wanted. Um, you know, your, your uh, direct TV is all a consequence of the satellites that were launched in those days. Uh, and at Hughes, I was given a free hand. I could do basically whatever I wanted, so long as part of it involved space radiation. And the challenge I set for myself was really to try to develop a, an erasable EEPROM. So in 19, around 1970, uh, Dov Froman at Intel uh, invented the floating gate EEPROM device. Uh, floating gate EEPROM device was uh, a semiconductor memory that was uh, encapsulated in a package that had a quartz window. It could be programmed with a program that the microprocessor uh, would basically dictated what the microprocessor would do, and it was erasable by ultraviolet light through that window, which took about 15 minutes. So you had to take this part out of the, the board, put it under a lamp, and erase it. Um, EEPROM, Froman's EEPROM were a very pivotal uh, uh, component in the microprocessor revolution. Basically, it enabled, you know, a, a general purpose a computing machine to have different instructions through the code stored mm -hmm. at EEPROM. What I was trying to do is to develop an e EEPROM, an electrically erasable EEPROM, as opposed to UV erasable. Okay. And that I did at uh, Hughes, and in fact, uh, uh, came up with the idea that uh, if you thin down the gate oxide of, of that floating gate, the froman benchkowski device, from a thousand angstroms to a hundred angstroms, then that hundred angstroms would in fact allow you to program and erase mm -hmm. electrically. This is called Fowler-Nordheim tunneling after two gentlemen, British gentlemen, that, I that discovered that phenomenon Okay, um, and then you applied it to this yes. particular problem. Right. So the problem at that time, and this is actually uh, <coughs> has Sorry. tremendous relevance to the flash memory industry, tremendous uh, impact. The, the problem was that uh, there was very little known in those days. This was 1976, 77, you know, 35 years ago. Very little known about thin films of SiO2. Uh, SiO2 was used in MOS transistors, but as I said before, it was about a thousand angstrom thick. The thinking was that if you thinned it too much, let's say to a hundred angstroms, it would basically be very leaky, uh, pinholes and breakdowns and so on. In order to make uh, an EEPROM device that used that very thin oxide, I had to basically develop the whole technology of uh, thin, very thin SiO2. Is it manufacturing technologies also for production? Yes. So at Hughes, again, I had this tremendous uh, freedom. I could, uh, I, I could do any. We did uh, ten, tens of thousands of samples over a two-year period and developed a very, very sophisticated technology and uh, and metrics to characterize these very thin films. And what I found out was that these films actually were very uh, reproducible, that you could make them with very high quality, very high integrity, that they would conduct very, uh, um, conduct electrons, both for programming and arrays between the substrate and the floating gate, but uh, that they eventually broke down because what would happen under very high electric fields that were required to program an arrays 
the oxide would over time degrade. It could only pass a certain amount of charge, electrons back and forth. And, and uh, in, the, in the process, you were creating traps in the oxide, in the thin oxide. Mm. Electrons started getting trapped in that oxide, and it would basically eventually fail. But before it failed, my calculations showed that we could achieve right arrays to over a million times, which was more than adequate. That's what I remember, because one of the uh, key marketing elements of these devices was the number of uh, read, write, erase cycles that you could perform on them while and still maintain the integrity of the device, which in most applications was not that frequent at all. Yes, right. Interesting. So Hughes was really a, a very good place to explore and develop. Are there any good stories of who people you worked with and and things that went really well and things that didn't go so well? And um, yes, I had some very good, my, you know, my, my boss, uh, Tom Toombs, who was the manager of the research center, uh, also a Prin Princeton PhD, gave me free hand and all the support, and I was able to do a phenomenal amount of uh, data gathering and experimentation that gave us a very, very clear understanding that this actually was a very viable, uh, th these thin films of uh, <coughs> silicon dioxide were very viable. Uh, and we very quickly went into um, uh, reduction to practice. We, I, I don't mean just by filing patents, but uh, more importantly, developing, developing the industry's first EEPROM device. It was an eight kilobit CMOS EEPROM. Now, did you put that into production? Did that part go yes. into, device go into production? Yes, it went into production, and in addition to that, we developed the first NOVRAM, which was a static RAM chip that was backed by a non-volatile uh, cell, so that when you, when the power was, was turned off, whatever state the sta static RAM six transistor cell was in would be programmed into the into the flash. Not it was not flash into the EE prom. So so these were the pre, uh, kind of precursors for the industry adopting EE prom. Intel came out with uh, their own EE prom. Um, uh, Seek was another uh, company that mm -hmm. developed that. Uh, and basically, the EEPROM industry was, was developed. Dov Froman, who was uh, a, a key uh, member of Intel's team, um, so, you know, so my publication. I published very extensively the work that I did at Hughes on these thin oxides in the Journal of Applied Physics in 19, 1978. He saw that, he <laughs> jumped on the next plane, came to Hughes, and recruited me to come to Intel. And that's, where I, that's how I came to the Valley in 1979. Okay. So the, uh, your experience at Intel, you were there for how many years? I was there two years. And you were worked uh, with Dove Froman at this point? Uh, no, Dove had gone to Israel to start Intel Israel. Okay. I was in the, uh, I was manager of the Santa Clara Technology Development Group. Intel at that time had three uh, technology development t uh, groups. One was Santa Clara, one was uh, Portland, Oregon, and one was, um, 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 what do you call it, N um, Livermore. Not Livermore, but, uh, well, it's Livermore. It was Livermore, yeah. Yes. Uh, Livermore was responsible for HMOS, static RAM. Um, Portland was responsible for DRAM. I was responsible for non-volatile memories and basic technology. Basic okay. technology was basically developing the first uh, steppers, the first dry etchers, the first uh, deposited oxides for the next generation of process technology. Okay, so who were some of the people you worked with uh, in the Intel days? So my boss was Jerry Parker. He was the head of all technology uh, at Intel. And you know, there were you know, the, the, the major people that uh, helped develop the technology. Ted Hoff was, uh, um, used uh, you know, our pilot line in Santa Clara. Ted Hoff once told me, this was 1980, and this is again relevant to my career, he once told me, if you can develop a memory technology that has 10x lower cost than the existing technology, 
the entire hierarchy of memories will will move away, b basically will part way to allow your technology to come into that hierarchy. And that stuck with me really until today. He was right on the money. So a factor of 10x in cost reduction is critical. And that's the, you know, an early lesson from Ted Hoff. Okay, good, good. So while you were at Intel, what, what products uh, were developed at that stage? How, to, how had e, these, this technology evolved from your Hughes days, your early Hughes days, up through uh, the state of the art at Intel? So um, it, Intel was focused very much on EEPROM. That was uh, still the, you know, the big money maker. My team developed the first uh, stepper-based dry edge 64 kilobit at Intel, which for three years carried Intel, was the most profitable pr uh, product at Intel. Uh, and we were working on relatively low density E square prom, EE prom, 16 kilobit or so. So that was, uh, EE prom really never made it as a major mainstream technology. It was a two transistor cell and not, uh, not particularly low cost. Okay, so the, the, the belief factor wasn't there yet within Intel for the technology or to? No, I think the breakthrough for, for EEPROM came really in 1984 with Mashwoka at um, Toshiba and um, uh, at Excel, I think uh, uh, Mukherjee and Chang um, at Excel, which was a small startup, that said, look, we can simplify this EEPROM, take out the access transistor. All we need is to erase the whole chip electrically instead of with a UV uh, lamp. That's already a huge step forward. Let's simplify it and that would make it cheaper. That was the invention of flash memory. Flash basically, okay. it's really an EEPROM, it, no, no, it was actually called flash EEPROM. It was still an EEPROM but you eliminated the access transistor and you bought yourself a much uh, simpler structure, basically one transistor that had thin oxide. Um, in the case of the Mashwoka flash device, actually it never worked, it was a, a triple poly structure. The Excel structure actually was the foundation of what Intel later called the ETOX flash, okay. no flash. So up until that time, the EE squared was a bit or erasable and rewritable, and they moved from the bit level to a block level or a full chip level. For the, the first flash was full chip level. Okay. Uh, Seek then introduced uh, sector, basically a page level. You could erase either the whole chip or one sector. Okay, good. So you were at Intel for two years, was it? Yes. And so where did you go after that and what was it that uh, got you excited about going to where it was you went? Yes, yeah, so after Intel I went to uh, Cinetech. Cinetech was a Honeywell company, another startup company whose major customers were Apple, the first, uh, the, the, the first Macintosh, the Apple II uses 6509, I think, 8-bit uh, processor from Cinetech and Atari. Atari uh, was, uh, you know, the, the ROM cartridges. Uh, then Atari was acquired by Warner Brothers and eventually the company went out of business. Nintendo drove them out of, basically. So at Cinetech I was uh, VP of technology and then VP of uh, operations and technology. I was there for about two years. Okay. And so was this your first startup experience? Well, Cinetech, I was not, uh, I w no. Uh, Robert Sh Schreiner was a founder and he had left and I left when he left. No, my first startup was after that in 1983. I started a company called Wafer Scale Integration, WSI. And the uh, original business plan, original business plan was to develop uh, basically mass storage systems using EEPROM. This, uh, this was 83, so at that time there was no flash yet. Okay. And I figured I would find a way to reduce, lower the cost of EEPROM. But uh, at wafer scale, uh, we actually ended up doing a completely different business plan. We never did what the original business plan. And why was that? 
because it was uh, too ambitious. The, the, the plan to develop mass storage with EEPROM was too, too far ahead of its time, if you will. Okay, so the technology <coughs> wasn't quite, was not quite ready big. for that level of... Right, and we couldn't find anybody to fund uh, that development. So we went instead and developed uh, CMOS EEPROM and programmable logic devices. I was at, uh, at WaferScale, I was, for the first two years I was CEO, for the, and for the next two years I became a chairman and CTO. Mm -hmm. I brought in a CEO, and um, after four years at WSI, I left the company and started SunDisk. So, so how was that uh, at uh, uh, WaferScale in terms of your first experience as the founder and building a company? What, what, what takeaways did you take from that as you moved forward in your career? I took away many, many lessons, unfortunately very painful lessons. I have lots of scars until today, but they were, I was very inexperienced. I made a very a large number of mistakes. Um, and uh, it would be, we would really have to be here for the next several hours to, to go over all the mistakes I made. But every one of those mistakes turned out to be very valuable later on. Uh, because I usually don't repeat. Well, the one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of, of these interviews is to really gain the wisdom from those that have walked the path and gone through these experiences onto greatness and building great companies. And so any, any of those thoughts you can share with us uh, are always valuable to the rest of us in the industry. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, well, certainly I consider myself as a second chance guy mm -hmm. uh, because my first chance at a startup I consider a failure and probably most investors would consider a failure even though eventually the company was sold to SD Micro. Uh, you know, the first mistake is uh, you think you can do anything. You can, you can do, you know, you, you can do uh, uh, memories and programmable logic and, you know, basically. And of course you can't. In a startup, if you want to succeed, you need to focus. You really need to focus. So the key, you, you need to have a very a laser sharp focus and the discipline to not stray left and right. Um, you need to hire really a very, uh, very talented, dedicated, passionate, and complementary team. Complementary, that means not, not, their skills are different than yours, together you make the whole, but that uh, share your vision. The vision must be very simple, very clear, that 30, 30 second elevator speech need to be really uh, believable and achievable. <coughs> You need to have a very clear strategy how to get there. You need to have enough cash in the bank because it always takes much, much longer than, than you think to get there. Mm -hmm. So if you have the right strategy, the right focus, the right people, um, and, and, and the right cash to get there, then w the rest is technology, really. What is your unfair competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know, as soon as you become anything in the market, your competitors will do their best to kill you. You know, there's no, this is not a, a this is a pretty hostile environment for startups, mm -hmm. uh, as we found out. Uh, so, we didn't have, under my CEO leadership, I was a technologist, I was not a CEO. I, I was a CEO that was not really a good CEO, and uh, was not focused. We were doing too many things. We had a board of directors that was really two separate boards. One thought they were investing in the memory technology company, one in a programmable logic company. Um, we, we spent too much money. You could say we never had enough money, but we didn't give it the respect that, okay. that, that you need. So, uh, at the end of the day, you have to take risks. A startup company is all about risk taking. There is no such thing as not taking risk. If you don't, if you don't take risk, you know, the way to fail in a startup is to take too much risk or stupid risk or bet your company kind of risks, unnecessarily so, or to not take enough risk. The key is uh, what's the right kind of risk and where do you put your bets and where do you bet your company if you do and do it 
as little as possible and try not to be betting your company in situations where you have no control of the forces that will determine the outcome. Mm. So, so at Wafer Seal, what were some of the forces that you realized you didn't have control of that uh, ultimately were, were uh, uh, critical? Well, we had, we had a divided company that, that you know, not only the was the board divided, we had a, a small company with a hundred or so employees, half of whom were doing memory and half of whom were doing logic. And okay. the rationale was this is programmable logic, you need to have the memory technology just pay the bills. But to be good in the memory technology, you have to be darn good. Mm -hmm. And to be good in the, in, in the programmable logic, you need to have fantastic software. Now, were, were, you, two different, uh, were you a fabulous company at that time? Yes, we were fabulous. So, so how did that work? Did you have to do technology development, or were you working through the technologies available through, because the foundry industry was just getting started at that point, wasn't it? Yes, 1983 was the, the good times for LSI logic, for VTI, VLSI technology. They were riding high. Yes, and we thought, hey, we have the programmable uh, element, you know, that, that we knew how to make EEPROM, e square prom. we were gonna program it instead of through a mask, a dedicated mask. So the idea was good, but it was, again, overly ambitious, and, and we didn't have enough, even though we raised quite a lot of money, I think 40, 50 million dollars, over four years, that was not enough. So you, you were you developing your own fab, or were you working with Foundry partners to implement the technologies you needed? We worked we, with Foundry partners, mostly uh, Sharp in Japan. Sharp was a very good partner. Okay. Interesting strategy. Yes. So after that, um, I guess um, I, I want to start to bring Jim here in at this point, because I think we're moving from the, the semiconductor phase into the, the founding of SunDisk, which ultimately became SanDisk. What, what was the story behind that change? So in, in 88, when I started SunDisk, I was looking for a name. And uh, by the way, just to, to close on WSI, uh, I left WSI uh, really at the kind of gentle uh, push out, if you will, of the board because the CEO that I brought in and I were not getting along well together. And that's another lesson for for entrepreneurs, that switch, you know, entrepreneurs stepping aside to bring a professional manager is, is deadly dangerous. It, it can kill the spirit of a company and, and kill the, you know. The heart. And the heart, heart yeah, the, the soul of, of the machine, if you will. And that's basically what happened at uh, WSI. So at, at w, when I saw SunDisk, which was, I was 43 years old, you could say a failure. Um, and you know, 43 is not a young age to start a company. But uh, I left on February 28th, 1988, and started my new company March 1st, the next day, uh, 1988. And I was optimistic as hell. I was just raring to go. And um, I had, uh, before leaving the company, I disclosed to the CEO and to to the board that I felt that flash was coming around the horizon and that it was beginning to look like the right time to develop a mass storage based on flash memory. The company and the board said, be our guest, you know. We're, there's no way we can do that as well as doing programmable logic and EEPROM. So it was an amicable separation, but uh, our parts, uh, so to get back to SunDisks, uh, uh, my daughter, who was 15 at that time, we were looking for names, and she came up with the name SunDisk, S-U-N-D-I-S-K. She said, it's just a sunny, uppity name. Uh, I remember we were driving around Fremont and she, in the car, and we said, I said immediately, this sounds really a great name. That's great. And that was the name that we had until 1995, for seven years. Before we went public, uh, Sun Microsystem had been in our case. Once we became relatively well known, they said, look, uh, we may have a disk drive division, Sun Disk or Sun Soft, 
They actually had a Sunsoft division. So you have to change your name. Uh, and they started suing us in different uh, countries for trademark. Uh, for, so I said, look, we've got some real wars out there, and this is one that we don't need to have. I went to uh, Sun, met uh, the CFO, I forgot his name, but a very decent guy. I said, look, uh, we are prepared to change our name to SAN, SunDisk. <coughs> SunDisk actually is Sand, Sand yeah. Silicon disk or sans disk no disk so it was actually good it sounded the same and in japan you didn't even have to change the letters in, in japanese sun disk and sun disk are the same uh, but i said but it's going to cost us so we uh, you need to help us so they agreed to pay us basically the full they gave us five years to phase out in our products and uh, basically pay the bill for all the copyrights and all the literature, everything that, very, 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 very classy. It would have cost them and us a hell of a lot more to fight it in the courts, of course. So this was a very, very good example of common sense prevailing. Picking your battles carefully. Picking your battles carefully, yeah. thank you. So, so, Jim, you had some questions uh, particularly around this. In 88, you were co-founder of SanDisk and became president and CEO. My understanding was shipments didn't really start until 93. Is that correct? We actually shipped. First, let me say that uh, my co-founders, who uh, uh, were with me, I mean, all, all the way. Uh, my second founder was Jack Yuan, who was our process engineer, a great process engineer, just recently retired. Sanjay Merotra was our third founder. He was our memory design guy. And he is today the CEO, so when I stepped down, he took over 23 years later. And that's really very rare for the three founders to be around from the early days uh, through all the growth phases of the company. And the fourth member is the one that I think you know, Bob Norman, who was our system architect and really um, a great guy, really a great guy. So uh, we started shipping our first product in 1991. The customer was IBM, Boca Raton. IBM at Boca Raton at that time was king of the PC world, right. um, entry system division. They were developing the industry's first pen computer. They called it um, the ThinkPad because it was a pad. There was no keyboard. Uh, it was an eight pound machine. It was eight by 11. Um, and they, needed, they were using a two and a half inch 20 megabyte drive from corner peripheral, and it was failing. Because you, you know, you'd go for inventory in the factory, you would drop it, the disk drive would fail. So, <coughs> so IBM sent out a, um, a RF, a re request for uh, proposals for, from the industry to develop a uh, 20 megabyte, two and a half inch, plug and play compatible ATA drive that would replace the 20 megabyte corner drive. And uh, they said, well, whoever does it, the, the RFP was for 10,000 units, 10,000 20 megabyte drives. For us, this was unbelievable, big. Uh, so we bid on it. Uh, so did Western Digital, who was also an investor in SanDisk, but we competed for that bid. And I believe TI also bid on that uh, thing. Uh, cut a long story short, we, we won that bid, which was amazing because we were like 40 people in the company uh, at the time that we won it. And at a certain point in time, I, I know for a fact that IBM had more people working at Boca Raton on helping us than, uh, than we had at SanDisk. Uh, but to cut a long story short, when, that, when we were ready and we shipped and the product was, this was basically the product. Uh, it had our own controller with off-the-shelf components, and it had cards, memory cards, that used our own flash chip. So each card was 10 megabyte. We had two cards, 20 megabyte, and you could, and this was a standard corner uh, interface, and this was a serious logic interface chip. Mm -hmm. So you could just, uh, and, and our firmware, of course, you unplugged the corner, you plug this, and it was solid state. The computer 
uh, it emulated a disk drive instruction set, everything of 88 instruction set. The computer thought it was talking to a disk drive. Of course, there was no rotating anything. And, <coughs> and it was really a, a major, major breakthrough because it took Flash that was very unreliable and made it totally, uh, its weaknesses totally transparent to IBM. However, the story of this is that when we shipped the first units to IBM, uh, engineering samples, uh, they, f they would fail after about one to two seconds of their diagnostic software. They would run it. So I talked to the, the, the key uh, reliability engineer and I said, well, you know, what gives? He says, well, look, don't, don't worry. Every time we get a new disk drive and we throw this, uh, you know, very, very, you know, not, we, we throw the book at, at the drive, it usually fails quite, quite, uh, quite, quite quickly. I said, well, when would you consider this to be a reliable device? He says, well, if I can run it over the weekend, if I can run several units over the weekend with no failure, with our diagnostic software, um, then you have a good product. So I said, well, give me a call when we reach that point. And it took six months before I got that call. Well, back in the early days of SanDisk, which we've been discussing, what was your initial evaluation of the opportunity in the storage markets? And what were all those kinds of markets for storage devices such as you were putting together? The original business plan, which I wrote in 1988, second half of 1988, saw just about every major opportunity that we eventually ended up delivering on. In fact, in 19, January 1990, just, uh, you know, 18, really 15 months after the company was started, I gave uh, um, an invited talk at the IEEE Santa Clara chapter uh, in Santa Clara University, and I still have the abstract from that meeting, and, I'm, and in that I talk about use of flash memory in cell phones, in digital cameras, uh, in portable fax machines, which was a phone before there was, there was no email, of course, in those days. Uh, so we, we basically uh, saw the application, of course, the industrial applications, the military applications. So, but the issues were, you know, we'll get back into that, but the issues was that we recognize because of my background as a device physicist, I recognized that flash was unreliable. Flash uh, could not, it could achieve a million cycles, but quite a few bits would fail before the distribution, the vast distribution would reach a million cycles. So how do you guarantee, in fact, the spec for e prom was typically 10,000 cycles. And when I went and talked to customers, potential customers, in the early days of SunDisk, they would say 10,000 cycles is, uh, is a, is a non-starter. If you, if you don't have a million write array cycles, don't bother. Um, so how to get from 10,000, which by itself was very difficult to do, to a million with zero failures was the challenge, number one. The second challenge was how do you make it low cost? because we were, you know, our first product was $50 per megabyte. That's $1,000 for that 20 megabyte. Not too many people would afford that kind of. So we had to make, to take a technology that had tremendous potential, but was like a frog that needed to become a prince. How do you take this technology that has the potential statistically to reach there, but you know, you, I can't tell you the next time I write into that memory, if any bit will fail and which one will. And the only solution was what we call system flash. Basically it said, you, the physics is the physics. The physics of failure, we understood, we knew it. it statistically, you could, you could predict very easily how many bits would fail. But, you know, standard techniques in those days were, you know, hardware redundancy. You had extra rows and extra columns. You, if a bit failed, you substituted with an extra row or an extra column, you tested it, it worked, you shipped the product. This was true for an EEPROM or even for an EEPROM. It was true for DRAM because DRAM didn't have 
a wear out mechanism. Study cram didn't have a wear out mechanism. Flash had wear out. And how do you overcome that wear out? The only solution we concluded was a system solution, a holistic solution that said you need a controller that works closed loop with that flash memory. The flash memory itself <coughs> needs to be architected to emulate a disk drive with a sector, with a header, header accessible by the controller and data, uh, and, and the sector itself accessible for data by the user. The controller had to work closed loop continuously with the flash memory, detecting bits before they were failing, before they were about to fail, or if they failed, replace them, map them out. If too many bits fail, map out an, an entire sector, map out entire region of the memory. Write, write data across the board, level out the wear out. Don't physically write always the same physical cells. Drive them, you know, so we had things like develop, uh, you know, hot count, which was really every sector, every time we, we erased it, we incremented by one the number of times it went through a write erase. Every sector had different voltage applied to it during write and erase to minimize the stress on that oxide. If you look at, at an Intel chip in those days, Intel would apply the maximum end of life voltage. It for the first pulse, and we said no. You know, multi the, in our case, you know, the the end of life voltage to get to a million cycles, we need to internally generate maybe 24 volts, but the first cycles, 12, 13 volts. So, the the the, the wisdom in those, you know, the, the 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 standard wisdom in those days is, you know, guarantee 24 volts, and program every time at 24 volts. We said, well, if you want to get to a million cycles program at the minimum that you need to and let's say 13 volts, well that voltage was stored in the sector, in the header, and next time we came to that sector we applied 13 volts, not 24. And that gave us the million cycles. The hot count, the wear-out leveling, the programmable uh, voltages, all of those things that were completely revolutionary could not be done at a chip level, but this is what the controller could do. And that was how we took Flash from really what we call code store, storing code, which is rarely ever changed, maybe once or twice, to storing data and content and software and images and music and so on. Well, your <coughs> company had a, a rather interesting interrelationship with some disk drive manufacturers. You had investments from companies like Seagate and uh, Western Digital, for example. Uh, what were those relationships like, and why were those companies so interested in your company? 1988, when we started the company, uh, my chairman was Erwin Federman, who was also on the board of Western Digital. So introdu he introduced me to Western Digital at their highest levels, including their technology team, but also their business side. And they were sold in 1988 on solid-state drive, on flash being the future technology. They were very, very early. Um, Kathy Braun, I'm sure you, know, you remember her, and uh, Carl Lofgren, very, very good guys. And they invested $2 million in the company. Unfortunately for them, <coughs> and we worked very closely together, and they brought some of the controller concepts, the ATA, I mean, they were pioneers in ATA. Uh, the problem for them was that their disk drive business was, they, they went into a trough and they just could not uh, continue to invest in our company and they basically pulled out, sold their stock. In 1992, when we were four years old, Seagate uh, came to us and um, they actually, uh, uh, Garrett Garretson, uh, uh, you probably remember the name from the past, uh, was very intrigued by solid state disk and came to us and spent some time with, with me and then uh, Al Sugart, Seagate's uh, founder and CEO at the time, came and said, look, um, I, you know, this looks like very interesting technology but um, 
we don't know where it's going to go. Maybe it's too early. I'd like to make a personal investment in your company, you know, just as, as an investor. I said, well, uh, let me talk to my board. And I came back to him. I said, look, uh, I would be really greatly honored uh, to have your investment. But uh, re what we really want is for Seagate to have a strategic partnership with us. Uh, so if you can get that, then it'll be, you know, th that's really what we'd like to do. So they took several additional months, and eventually they concluded that they wanted to acquire the company. This was 1992. Um, well, I wasn't interested in selling the company. Uh, so we, we, we started negotiating, Al and I, and we were, uh, I was not prepared to sell more than 25% of the company, and he wanted 35%, which I felt was as, much, as good as selling the company. Um, cut a long story short, he accepted 25%. They put $30 million into the company, and we had a very, very good relationship for quite a number of years. They were clearly ahead of the time as far as uh, solid state disk really just now coming into being because the cost wasn't right. It was way too expensive. Uh, and even now, it's just kind of borderline crossing into affordable. So Al joined our board. Uh, stayed with our, our board until, uh, you know, very close to his, uh, his, his passing away. Was a great, great board member, and Seagate was a very good partner, very good partner. The original uh, plan with Seagate was that they would be our sales channel. We would manufact do the development, do the manufacturing of these 20 megabyte drives, and they would sell it to their customers. That, that turned out to be, that almost killed us, even though it was with the best intentions. It really was with the best intentions. They were not trying to kill us. But uh, they couldn't get their sales guys, <coughs> could not get their sales guys to, to sell the product. Because it re required a very, very long design in cycle. It was a brand new technology. The sales force didn't know anything about flash memory. So a year into this thing, we were selling nothing, you know, diddly. So I went to Al and uh, his, uh, his CFO and VP of Worldwide Marketing and Sales, and I said, look, guys, you, you're, you're killing the company. We're spiffing you know, a special promotion incentives to our sales force. Every design win is $20,000. Sounds great. But if they don't meet the quarter of $40 million a quarter of disk drive sales, they're out. So, so they go for the quarter. Um, so, so this is not working. So they, so Al says, okay, what do you want us to do? I said, well, give us these seven guys, your sales guys, because we know now after a year that these guys are the fanatic guys that really love flash memory, and get out of our way. You know, let us handle the sales. J just forget about what we have in the contract. We'll take over. Uh, make sure that uh, Hamilton, Avnet, uh, Aro. All the industrial distributors are still with us because we were tiny, and help us at uh, you know Comdex and so on. They did all of that, all of it. I mean, it was just wonderful the way they were very mature about it. They accepted it, and that really helped us. Um, that's when we really started selling. So 1993 was about the time. Okay. So going back to the markets, how has the original concept? for SanDisk products and markets evolved with the evolution of the market for data storage products, as we have all kinds of applications now that are being used with flash memory. How has your uh, concept of the market opportunity for the company evolved to take advantage of all of that? So very early on, we, as I said, from day one, we knew that the cost had to come down dramatically that there was no way we we're going to build a mass market with a cost of you know, $50 per megabyte or even $1 per megabyte. It's been suggested that price is the most important technology product. <laughs> yes, and Moore's Law came in very, very handy in that regard. So we definitely practiced Moore's Law to the hilt. We, uh, starting in 1991, with uh, our first product, used our own 4 megabit flash chip. It was the only 4 megabyte, 4 megabit 
chip in the market. And we went from uh, 4 megabit in 1991 to 64 gigabit chip today. 64 gigabit. So we went through 14 generations, 14 doublings, 2 to the 14. And that allowed us to bring the cost of flush down over that period by about 30,000 times. 30,000 times cumulative cost reduction, which means that if you were to buy a $3,000 PC in 1991, $3,000, you would pay for it today 10 cents. 3,000, you know, down to 10. That, that's the 30,000 factor. You say 30,000 people think about 30,000 percent. No, it's 30,000 times. I remember Ted Hoff saying if you reduce the price by a factor of 10, so here you have a 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 3, and we'll get the next 10. So every time we were able to bring the cost down by a factor of 10, we would invade a new market and we would disrupt an existing uh, market. The first one, of course, was the film and digital film replacing silver highlight. Silver highlight, think about it, was, you know, $3.99 a roll of film and phenomenal quality. And here we were out at, you know, our, our first, uh, first card, which we made for Kodak. This is a two megabyte card that we sold Kodak for a hundred bucks, fifty dollars per megabyte. So we, we knew it has to come down. First of all, it had to come down in size. This was way too big for anything portable. Secondly, we said this is a very low power technology. It is non-volatile. You don't need battery. When you can store information indefinitely. So it's ideal for storage of information, content, mass storage, in anything portable. Anything portable needs to be very small. So our first product, we condense all of this into this, which is the PCMCIA card, which we were founding members. This had already all the controller inside, as well as the flash memory, and it had a standard interface. We even went to the disk drive guys, Seagate and um, some of the other guys, I think, uh, um, anyway, I, I forgot their name, and said, look, we'll work with you so that you could put a disk drive inside that was a thicker device, you know, five millimeter up from 3.3 millimeter. So, uh, but that turned out to be too big for cameras and phones. This actually went into an IBM phone. This was an IBM phone that uh, it's called a Simon. It was the brick. IBM shipped that to Bell South. And this was, you know, the, f the funny story on this card is that uh, we didn't sell too many of them because it was really a brick. IBM designed the, the brick phone for uh, Bell South with the wrong connector on their side. This is a, a mother connector. So when, we, when you would plug it, it would get stuck. So they said, they came to us and said, we can't do anything about the phone. Can you do anything about the card? So we had a, an operator spray a lubricant into, into this thing so it would slide in and out. <laughs> a conductive lubricant. Uh, anyway, this was too big. So this was developed, we developed this together with uh, Canon and Kodak. And then this became too big for consumer electronics. So then came the SD card. That became too big for cell phones and that drove us to today, which is the, the micro SD, which you can barely see at them. But the micro SD today, which SunDisk makes up to 64 gigabyte, 64 gigabyte storage capacity uh, with eight or 16 flash chips sitting inside. The wafer is thin down, you can see through it. And you put eight or 16 stacking one on top of each other and the controller all inside this thing, 64 gigabyte. As you're developing all of those markets and selling all those increased products, at a much reduced price per unit. Didn't your production have to go up incredibly high during that period? Yes, our production uh, If you're going to keep up with the same amount of money in the till? Yes, you, yes, yes, of course. I mean, this, you're right. 
you could either sell 100 units or, or 10,000 units for $1,000 or a million units for $10. And we preferred a million units for $10 because we always felt that if we were not going to do it, competition so will do where it. where were you making all of those flash memory products? So we actually, we were a fabulous company. In a way, we are still, SunDisk still is a fabulous company today, except that SunDisk has so far invested approximately $9 billion at last count in manufacturing that uh, is captive capacity that SunDisk owns. Um, so we, we started with AT&T in Allentown as our manufacturing supplier, foundry. Uh, they bec after a while, they, we felt that they were not competitive. We moved to Japan, Matsushita. Matsushita was a very good supplier, but after a while, they too were unable to meet our cost requirements. So from there, we went to Korea, LG Semicon. Uh, there's another story. They were a good supplier, but up to a point. Then we went to Japan, NEC and then UMC in Taiwan, where we had a good relationship, and finally, in the last 11 years, 12 years with Toshiba, where we have a joint venture fabs, 50-50, uh, actually some of the fabs are 40-60 in their favor. So yes, the volume is huge. The volume is huge, the investments are huge. Um, and yeah, you make it the old fashioned way, the, by selling a lot of volume. So Sundays today builds, uh, you know, close to two million cards or, s or units a day and sells them worldwide. And it, this would not have been possible if, if it was not for this cost reduction. Uh, you know, the, the, the USB flash drive displacing uh, the floppy disk, um, embedded flash replacing tape in the Sony Walkman replacing CDs in the MP3 players, uh, now starting to displace uh, DVDs in movies. Uh, y your iPhone and, and I, you know, iPad, all the tablets uh, that have you know, 128 gigabytes, 64 gigabyte of memory, it's all flash, it's all system flash. There's no way that you can do it without managing the flash. While you were evolving all of that growth, uh, were and, and the semiconductor industry and startups, there were scores of other companies starting to produce flash memory products. So you were evolving with growth at the same time. There was a tremendous growth in the number of competitors. Did you set up cooperative arrangements with any of those other companies making flash memories? No, the only really important partnership that we had and have was with Toshiba. Toshiba was very interested in our multi-level cell patents and know-how. Multi-level cell was very, very important. In that factor of 30,000 cost reduction, multi-level cell was critical because it allowed you to store two or three or four bits on every transistor. So, so you, were, you were continuing technology development at a fundamental level then in the flash market to drive your cost and, and density. Yes, we never stopped, and in fact, if anything, I believe that SunDisk is the, is the world's leader in technology development and understanding, together with Toshiba, of fundamental flash scaling, device issues, device scaling, and also not just flash, non-flash, which is the, the current uh, production workhorse technology, but also 3D memory, vertical NAND and so on. Uh, SunDisk spends a great deal of, of its uh, operating expenses in R&D and I was frankly uh, personally very deeply involved on the technology side until the day I retired because this is my love. Now, uh, SunDisk, does, does, does it sell flash chips themselves or is it really the, the, the modules with the controller that is the, the heart of the company? Um, from day one, we decided we're not going to sell flash components, standalone, and we've never changed. I, I take that back. We do today now sell wafers, and you, you can buy a controller from a Taiwanese manufacturer and buy our wafers and, and package your own device. But the chips were always intended to be part of a, of a system. There always was an expectation 
that there was a controller and that the controller knew how the flash worked. So, so the answer is no, we never sold flash components uh, and all of our competitors did. I mean, Intel sold flash components, Toshiba uh, SD Micro and so on. Um, as far as all the, the companies, the small companies, yes, um, there, there were a lot. And in fact, we, our policy, our strategy on licensing was to license all cameras. We, we did not try to be a Polaroid, you know. Uh, you can't step into this thing. On the contrary, we said, you know, for these markets to be very large markets, competition was essential. Kodak wasn't going to buy flash memory cards if SanDisk was the only supplier. We understood that. Fuji, same thing. So we had to actually bring in competition, but we didn't want to, you know, you know, we, we felt we've developed the market, we've developed technology, we have the patents, they should pay us because they have the economies of scales that we don't have. And that has worked very well for the company. The smaller companies found that it was, it was just very impo almost impossible for small companies to uh, play on this incredibly rapid um, technology scaling. Uh, Moore's law, think about it, in, 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 in 2001, we were at, two, at 256 megabit NAND chip, and today we are 64 gigabit NAND chip. That is uh, 10 generations of technology, nine generations of technology in 11 years. Nine generations in 11 years. For a small startup, it's almost impossible, even for a large company like Hitachi that tried to be in this market, um, AMD that tried to be in this market. It, 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 in the space of the last 11 years, we overshot way past let's, uh, the, the cost of DRAM. Cost per bit of flash is about a tenth of that of DRAM. And we are, you know, at least for low capacities, we're approaching the cost of uh, hard disk drive for, for low density, you know, 100 gigabytes or so. Well, at the end of the 90s, in 1999, IBM tried to compete with disk drives again with their one inch micro drive, of which I gave you a sample over there. And it should be noted that there's some in the micro drive, as you'll notice on the back, you can see what's inside that drive. There's a cost of all those items involved. There's a couple of, uh, there's the, the magnetic disks, there's the heads, there's a motor to make those disks spin, there's another motor to move the actuator, there's probably at least three semiconductors to make those motors under control and to process the data coming in and out of it, and an incredibly precise group of little metal parts in that mechanism. Now, given all of that, the manufacturer of the drive probably has a cost of about $45 just for the cost of the materials in all of those products. And if he adds a little profit and gross margin on top of that, it's probably a $50 item at least. Yes. Now, <clears throat> did you regard that as serious competition? Incidentally, those one-inch drives were driven out of the market by flash memory after a couple of years, and I think you had a major part in that, didn't you? Yes, so first of all, we worked with IBM to have the ability for their disk drive, micro drive, compatible with our flash. So we did not try to stop IBM coming into that market. We always had confidence that Moore's law would work in our favor. If you look at what you have here and compare it what we had in our equivalent part, the inside, you can see a controller chip and a memory chip. That's it. No moving parts, none of that. Now, so long as flash chip was, you know, $100 or so, very, very expensive, IBM had an advantage, even at $50 cost. But we were able to go way below $50, of course. So uh, IBM, uh, when, they when they announced their first micro drive, that day our stock dropped by 20% because IBM presented it as the flash killer. They said, we can fit into your camera. Uh, we have developed a very low power disk drive and it's, you get 340 megabytes instead of eight megabytes for the same price. And initially they were right. 
but very, very quickly we overtook them. They were not unique. We had competition, you know, the HP uh, Kitty Hawk 1.3 inch drive also tried to displace us. The Iomega uh, Click drive, 40 megabytes on, on a, um, the IBM uh, uh, milli, Millipede, uh, that you know, it was supposed to be, you know, probes, probe technology. And they ha all had that long list of parts which they were made of and therefore had a high cost. Yes. And what everybody ignored was the power of Moore's law. And the power of integration and basically, I mean, that controller, which uh, initially was like $70, $70 bill of materials and, and, you know, off the shelf, $70. Today, the controller that goes in here uh, is under 20 cents. Under 20 cents, 32-bit microcontroller, um, you know, ARM processor, um, about a thousand times faster for, you know, from $70 to 20 cents. So this is the power of semiconductors that is, that it was like wave after wave of disruption in the marketplace over the last 20 years. The first wave, as I said, is the film. The next wave, the floppy. The next wave, the tape. Then the CD. Then the DVD. And now coming to the hard disk drive. It's just, it, it, it's just, uh, it, it's just unbelievable. It's it's a revolutionary force. That, it, it's amazing how little respect, frankly, Flash gets. The the technology inside this, the technology inside, you know, you have 64 gigabyte. This is a three bit per cell technology. Every, every transistor store three bits. 64 gigabyte is, is about, you know, 200 billion, 150 billion transistors. Billion transistors. You know, the most advanced Intel microprocessor is what? Five billion transistors? So it, Flash now is driving the technology further than anybody else. I mean, Flash is at 20 nanometer. 20 na we, Sundays just announced 19 nanometer NAND Flash. It will be introduced next year in production. It will support 128 gigabit on a chip, 16 gigabyte chips. With 16 gigabyte and 16 of these chips, uh, this is 256 megabyte. Gigabyte! 256 gigabyte. We have a continuous evolution of mobile applications with every year somebody coming up with new mobile applications, something new to fit in your shirt pocket or something new to put on your, uh, one of these little book size computers, etc. Uh, are the applications you have or your company has still under development adequate to develop all of these markets? The, the market has always surprised us on the, the size growing bigger than we thought. I remember around 2005, you know, five, six years ago, when we recognized, six, seven years ago, we recognized the mobile opportunity and started developing uh, the micro SD for, for mobile phones. The, but I remember sitting in meetings and we were saying, well, you know, you, you need to have like eight gigabyte storage, eight gigabyte storage in a phone with a hundred million phones that would use that. Why would a hundred million people need eight gigabyte in a phone? We, we, we could not see it coming, but we said, you know, build it, they'll come. And today, you know, there's, you know, with, with the iPhone and the, and the Android phone and so on and the, and the tablet, of course, it's not just eight gigabytes, more like six, 32, 64 gigabyte and a hundred million is nothing. We didn't see also China coming and India coming. So the, all the BRIC countries that are now beginning to, everybody there wants a camera and everybody uh, there wants a smartphone. So. I want to ask a wind up question here. Go ahead. In 2009, Ellie, you were awarded the IEEE Noise Medal. What was your reaction to that kind of award? This was the greatest honor that any device guy, any semiconductor guy could hope for. I mean, this was a great honor. Robert Noyce, you know, the inventor of the integrated circuit, the f really the founder of Fairchild and founder of Intel, co-founder, uh, the father of, uh, of semiconductors, um, 
I worked at Intel when he was still there. He was already in chairman role and more the outside guy. So I, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him. I had a lot more with Gordon Moore and Andy Grove. But um, great, great honor, great man. It's just, um, it's amazing. It's only, you know, the integrated circuit was invented in 1959. It's only 52 years ago. 52 years ago, a technology that nothing has ever so radically revolutionized people's lives as the integrated circuit. Nothing. I mean, not not the combustion engine. Not, I mean, not. It's just amazing. So now, interesting. When I got that award, I went to uh, to bookstores to learn some more about you know his 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 life's history, Robert Noyce's Bob Noyce. I was amazed how few people had even heard his name, which was just shocking. Such a, a great man who had done so much, so much, and very few people outside of, I mean, it's just amazing. So this is really good that you have a museum of computer history <laughs> that at least one place here that... Well, uh, I'm an IEEE Life member and I'd like to say congratulations on that award myself. Thank you. And I'd like to ask you how you feel about your contribution to the industry in establishing that company called originally for the sun and later for the sand, your contributions for that company and how you feel about having served it all that time until just recently. And your contributions to the semiconductor industry through the technology development. Oh, it's a huge privilege, obviously. I mean, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. I was born at the right time, at the right place and, um, you know, was given the opportunity. And I'm an immigrant to boot, you know. I came to the United States as an immigrant. And um, I think this is a, a land of immigrants, a land of uh, second chances. Certainly I had that. Um, but I didn't do it alone, of course. There were some very, very good people that uh, together helped make this happen. It was we had some very, very tough times, some very, very hard times. Um, uh, people were always trying to destroy us, to kill us, because we were destroying their business, not that we wanted to. I, there was a, a last year, 2010, uh, Consumer Electronics Show, I was walking through the booth and uh, with, with another guy, a Sunday's guy. So when we go into the Kodak booth, he kind of whispers to me, he kind of in jest, he says, you know, you better not let them know who you are. And I said, I was a little puzzled. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, well, you are the man, who, you are the man who killed Kodak. And I thought about it and actually, no, really Kodak killed Kodak. I didn't kill Kodak. Nobody killed Kodak. They killed themselves. We worked with Kodak Japan on this compact flash. Parts of Kodak understood the, the value and the power of this technology and were very strong partners of ours. But the hubris, you know, that you get at, at some of these companies that have a monopoly. Kodak had 70% market share in film. There were 65% or so uh, gross margin. So they were just milking it and they, would ju they just wanted this thing to go away. And you know, they, they had the technology. Kodak had the CCD technology. They had the imaging. They, have, they had everything they needed to displace themselves, but they didn't have the guts to do it. And it was done for them. I mean, we were part of that. We enabled digital photography, but it was not, we never dreamed that we would, what had happened. The, the dramatic, because silver highlight is such a good technology. Really, I mean, you have 30 megapixel resolution, per, you know, perfect images for, for, for 299, 399, for 24. So, but you kind of see the extent of the devastation to Kodak. Uh, their market cap today is about one tenth of SanDisk market cap, and I think that we are undervalued. <laughs> so, uh, this is a very unforgiving uh, uh, 
field, consumer electronics and, and mobile computing, you see what's happening with Nokia, you know, going from, you know, peak of the hill, you know, Apple comes around and, and Android follows and everything changes so quickly, yeah. so quickly. So it's, a, 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 as I said, an incredible uh, privilege to be, uh, to have had the opportunity as CEO, as founder, as a technologist, to be not just at a front row seat to all of these uh, changes, but actually in the ring, you know, <laughs> boxing and getting punched from time to time and having the setbacks from time to time. It was a phenomenal journey, phenomenal journey, and I'm just grateful. Well, I've had an opportunity to watch the progress of your company and your management over the years, and as you know, you and I have met many times over the years, and uh, all I can say is, personally, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Same for me. Thank you, George. Excellent. Good. good. I think we're I think done. we come to it, right? no? More or less. Yeah. Good. Well, Elena, we had a great uh, discussion here, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure. Good.